Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. John Curran, who was the first chair, the first convener of the Classical Association in Northern Ireland, and he's our current treasurer. Um, he's also senior lecturer in ancient history at Queen's University of Belfast. He studied at Queen's himself before heading to Worcester College in Oxford for his DPhil and he's been a visiting scholar at Worcester College as well as a visiting fellow at St John's College, Oxford. He sits on the Council of the UK Classical Association and closer to home he's on the Central Council of the Classical Association of Ireland and John's general research interests are the Roman and Mediterranean world, religion and Judaism. And this evening, John is going to talk to us about Freud, the Greeks and the invention of personality. I know. Over to you, John. Okay, thank you very much, Helen. Um, I hope everybody can, uh, can, see, the, um, can see the slides. Uh, Peter tells me that uh, today is the 2773rd uh, anniversary of the foundation of Rome, which is, uh, I think, very, very auspicious. Um, but I can tell you that it is also the 125th anniversary to the day of Freud's delivery of the uh, lecture on the etiology of hysteria, which... Um, posited the uh, sexual origins of hysteria and which got an absolutely terrible reception. So um, that's rather less, uh, rather less auspicious, but uh, I shall do my best. Okay, this is um, Freud Corner um, in Golders Green Crematorium uh, in Northwest London. And it's the final resting place, as you can see, of uh, Sigmund and Martha Freud. Um, the ashes of the Freuds actually reside in this crater that you see uh, on top of the uh, on top of the uh, stele, the monument, and it's a so-called bell crater uh, from uh, Apulia in southern Italy, uh, dating probably to the fourth century BC and it's richly decorated with Dionysian scenes. Um, it was a gift from Princess uh, Mary Bonaparte, uh, no less. Uh, it was a grand, uh, grand a great grandniece of Napoleon I, and uh, she was herself a distinguished uh, psychoanalyst, and she presented this crater to uh, Freud on the occasion of his 75th birthday on the 6th of May, 1931. Um, the, the object was for a full decade uh, on display in, in Freud's uh, consulting rooms in, uh, in Vienna, 19 Bergasse to be precise, um, and it is a powerful testimony I think to the uh, attachment that Freud had with uh, the cultures of classical antiquity, above all uh, the culture of classical Greece. Um, and that's really the subject of, uh, of, tonight's, uh, of tonight's lecture. Now, here's a second object I, I want to draw your attention to. This is the so-called SE, or the Standard Edition of Freud's uh, Collected Works, edited there in 24 volumes uh, by James Strachey and uh, various others. And the collected works of, uh, of Freud are, um, I mean, not only a terrific read, I mean, I've only been able to sample some of them. Uh, Freud, in fact, uh, received uh, an, an award, a literary award in 1930 for the excellence of his prose. He's a terrific, uh, terrific writer. Um, but in the collected works of Freud, there are hundreds, uh, hundreds of uh, references to classical, fi classical figures and classical uh, myths. And what I want to do tonight is um, I want really to weave together two broad, uh, two broad strands. I want to uh, show you how um, scholarship on classical antiquity, uh, above all Greek antiquity, um, is important for understanding the genesis 
and the character of uh, some of Freud's most uh, famous ideas. Um, and the second thing I want to do um, is to look at the way in which um, some of Freud's ideas and his, uh, uh, his encounter with classical culture tell us something about the man himself. So broadly speaking, uh, my talk then um, is broken down into four uh, themes. Uh, I want to look first of all at what I'm going to call Freud's building, his, um, his intellectual formation, uh, his roots, as it were, uh, academically in classical study. Then I want to have a look briefly at um, some of Freud's uh, famous classically inspired neuroses, um, uh, quirks in thinking, um, distortions in thinking that he himself called uh, neuroses. Um, and some of these had interesting, uh, kind of interesting classical background to them. Then I want to have a look in the main section of tonight's presentation at um, classical influences on some of the key ideas uh, advocated by Freud. And then finally, I want to turn my attention to material culture and have a look at Freud and his relationship to archaeology. So let's proceed then to have a look at Freud's uh, building, his, his formation. Okay, Freud was born in Freiburg in Moravia in 1856, May 1856, and he died on September the 23rd, uh, 1939 in London. Um, from his uh, appearance, he was an adored and uh, precocious child. Um, his sister re reported that um, even in the fairly humble uh, family accommodation uh, of Freud's early years, the, um, the, the arrangement of their apartment always reserved a room uh, for Freud to live and sleep in. Um, and he always had it to himself. The other children uh, and Freud had uh, six siblings who survived to uh, adulthood. So the other children had to kind of fit around uh, Freud and uh, he himself in his room uh, acquired an extensive library, ever-growing uh, library. So he had this kind of privileged um, uh, status in the in the family dynamics. He entered uh, Leopoldstädter Kommunal Real Gymnasium in Vienna in 1865 and he graduated from it in 1873. And we can recover the uh, curriculum of the uh, school itself and we can see that fully two-thirds of the uh, school's curriculum was taken up at that time with the study of ancient languages and history. Um, and you won't be surprised to learn that Freud, young Freud, enjoyed an absolutely spectacular um, uh, academic career, uh, successful in everything he uh, turned his hand to uh, intellectually. And when he was 69 years old, um, he uh, wrote a kind of memoir of his time and in it he made a point of mentioning how proud recollections. He also recorded that for his matura, uh, that's his final examination uh, in the uh, high school, he had to translate uh, lines 14 to 57 of Sophocles's Oedipus Tyrannus, also known as Oedipus Rex. Um, this is the speech of uh, Zeus who laments to Oedipus uh, the condition of plague-ravaged Thebes. And he tells us that he also had to translate lines 176 to 223 of uh, Virgil's uh, Aeneid, Book 9, uh, the episode uh, about the uh, deaths of Nisus and Euryalus. Now, when Freud um, left Vienna um, in 1938, um, he arranged for his most treasured uh, books, the books that had uh, accompanied him most, most dearly um, in his intellectual journey, to be sent to London. Um, and this library of Freud's uh, resides in the Freud Museum 
Um, and that's uh, in Mar Maresfield Gardens in London. Okay, that's currently the Freud Museum and it includes um, uh, Freud's library. And not only can we see the uh, books that Freud uh, possessed, but in fact, we've also been able to um, see what Freud annotated in the books that he read. And uh, the first person I want to mention uh, in this context is this man, the famous uh, Swiss historian Jakob Burkhardt. And uh, here in uh, a letter in January 1899 to uh, a famous friend and collaborator, Wilhelm Fleiss, uh, Freud writes, for relaxation, I'm reading Burkhardt's History of Greek Civilization, which is providing me with unexpected parallels. My predilection for the prehistoric in all its human forms remains the same. Now, Burkhardt's History of Greek Civilization is a very important work in the history of scholarship itself, because in fact it marked um, an abrupt change of direction uh, in the uh, academic study of Greek civilization and in particular of Greek religion. Um, because the work emerged from a rather different intellectual and cultural milieu um, where um, the classical world enjoyed a very, very high uh, status, very high cultural status, um, what was also viewed in a very uh, conservative and uh, technical uh, scientific sense. Okay, but that uh, sense was uh, overturned really, uh, uh, profoundly attacked by another great classicist of the age, Friedrich Nietzsche. And uh, Nietzsche himself, um, in a number of his works, actually uh, recovered or um, uh, suggested that there was a darker, much darker, more mysterious, more primal side to uh, Greek culture and to uh, Greek religion. Now Burkhardt and Nietzsche actually knew each other well. Uh, first as uh, Nietzsche was a student I think of Burkhardt's and they ended up as, as colleagues in, uh, in Switzerland. And from Nietzsche's uh, ideas, Burkhardt actually put forward the idea that Greek religion wasn't the creation of a priestly elite, but was in fact generated by the people themselves. So the gods of Greek myth arose not from people's perception of nature, but from the emotions excited by the human struggle and the inner lives of human beings themselves. Okay, so a very, very different turn in the uh, thinking about Greek culture and, uh, and life. Now, Freud marked multiple passages in uh, Burkhardt's book, but he drew a double line, which is very, very rare for him, a double line at one particular passage where Burkhardt mentioned uh, the castration of uh, Uranus by Kronos. And uh, Burkhardt commented that this uh, mythical act was, and I quote, the cause of the things which cause anxiety for mankind, uh, and chief among the anxieties isolated by uh, Burkhardt was what he called fated death or Schicksal tod in German. And what's interesting here is that in 1899, Freud was reading this, um, and in the very same year, he identified Sophocles' Oedipus Tyrannos as a tragedy of Schicksal. Uh, so the two uh, lines of thinking come together in this uh, climactic year of 1899. Now let's turn aside briefly to have a look at what I'm going to call Freud's classical uh, uh, neuroses. Okay, now, one of Freud's most famous memories from his youth uh, was a story told to him by his father. Uh, about an experience of anti-Semitism in Freiburg. Um, and uh, the story is that uh, Jakob Freud, Freud's father, uh, was walking along one day and uh, met a man coming towards him on the pavement who uh, abused him, calling him a dirty Jew and knocked his hat off. Uh, and the young Freud uh, asked his father uh, what he did about this. And the elder Freud said that he had taken his hat and he had put it back on his head and simply walked on his way. Okay, um, And Freud wrote 
about this story, and, I, and I'm quoting him here. He wrote, I contrasted this situation with another which fitted my feelings better. The scene from the Greek historian Polybius, in which Hannibal's father, Hamilcar Barker, made his boy swear before the household altar to take vengeance on the Romans. Ever since that time, Hannibal had a place in my fantasies. So this famous historical set piece of uh, Hannibal swearing undying uh, hatred and enmity uh, against Rome uh, loomed large in the youthful uh, mind of Freud. Famous set piece in, uh, in art, and there it is in the, um, in the 18th century. Uh, reproduced by Giovanni Antonio Pellegrini. Okay, so uh, high romantic, high romantic art and a romantic scene. Uh, the other thing that Freud knew was that Carthaginian civilization had its mythic roots in the Semitic Near East, um, the eastern shore of the uh, Mediterranean, and this uh, struck a chord with his sense of uh, Jewishness, and he later wrote in the famous work of the interpretation of dreams that we're going to see later on. Um, he quote, uh, to my youthful mind, Hannibal and Rome symbolized the conflict between the tenacity of Jewry and the organization of the Catholic Church. So um, the idea it, it expanded in, in Freud's mind into, or to encapsulate uh, um, a, a classic meeting of cultures in his own time, that between Judaism and Roman Catholicism. And, you know, in a neurotic sense, um, Freud recorded that he wanted to, for many years to visit Rome, but couldn't find um, uh, couldn't find the, the strength, the determination to get there. In fact, he tried several times, and what's interesting is he said that he got no further than Trasimeno, and Trasimeno in central Italy is, of course, the site of Hannibal's favorite, uh, famous uh, victory over the Romans from twenty, uh, from, sorry, from two hundred and eighteen BC. So, um, an interesting classical uh, neurosis. Uh, playing out in, in Freud's mind. He actually overcame this mental block eventually in September 1901 and he came to, uh, to uh, love Rome um, and visited several times. In 1904 he made it to Athens um, and included in the party of travellers was this man, uh, Wilhelm Dortfield, famous architect and um, archaeologist of the time and apparently uh, while traveling Freud was too intimidated uh, to talk uh, even to the great Dortfeld. Uh, so great was his uh, admiration for uh, the archaeological achievements. Dortfeld was a, um, a colleague, a collaborator with uh, Heinrich Schliemann whom we're going to meet as well uh, later on. So eventually Freud made it as far as the Acropolis and on the Acropolis he had one of these um, near neurotic episodes uh, where he experienced a kind of a swooning sensation, he says, um, when he saw the columns of the Acropolis, they were the most beautiful things that he'd ever seen. And the, th the thought then suddenly followed, as he puts it, so all this does exist, just as we learned at school. Um, and so he had a kind of uh, out of body experience um, uh, when he finally got to, uh, when he finally got to the Acropolis. And on the occasion of his 50th birthday, uh, he was presented with this object um, uh, by his uh, circle of admirers. And uh, you can see his profile there, um, place of presentation Vienna. And then on the right hand side, um, the, um, the interview, the meeting between uh, Oedipus and the Sphinx. And the inscription on the right hand side reproduces a line of Sophocles from the play Oedipus Tyrannus. Uh, where uh, Oedipus is described as a man of very great powers uh, and uh, one who saw through the secret riddle. Uh, Oedipus famously solves the, uh, the riddle of the Sphinx. And what's interesting here is that an early biographer of uh, Freud, uh, one of his friends called Ernest Jones, describes what happened to Freud when he received this object. And uh, here's Jones's account. He says, Something strange happened when the medallion was handed to him. After reading the inscription, Freud grew pale, became agitated, and with a strange voice asked who had chosen this inscription. He reacted as if something, um, sorry, he reacted as if he'd just met something again. 
Actually, it was this that just happened. Phaedron told Freud it was he who had chosen the quotation. Then Freud let them all know that as a young student at Vienna, he was accustomed to walk around the great court and look at the busts of the old famous professors. It was then uh, that he not only had the, the phantasm, the, the phantasm, sorry, the phantasm of viewing his own future bust that should not come as a surprise from an ambitious student, but also that he had imagined this bust precisely with exactly the same words on the medallion. So uh, when we think about Freud the man, his life uh, has these episodes in it um, where uh, his uh, neurotic or, and, and eccentric um, uh, feelings uh, were triggered by these classical, uh, classical themes. So uh, uh, an interesting and, and uh, uh, intimate connection between ancient culture and the personality uh, of Freud. So let's just have a look then at uh, some of Freud's uh, most famous uh, ideas. And I, I just want to begin with the term psyche um, because uh, it's one of the most famous of all uh, Greek words and it's a word that has passed into the general discourse on uh, psychology, psychiatry, mental health. Um, and in 1890 uh, Freud wrote an essay called psychical or mental treatment and in it he wrote psyche is a greek word which may be translated soul thus psychical treatment means treatment of the soul and words are the essential tool of psychic treatment so uh, right at the foundation of his uh, clinical work was this perception this definition of uh, uh, psyche as meaning uh, as meaning soul and one little detail here is that that essay containing that uh, quotation was actually omitted by Freud in an early collection of his, uh, his essays. And the, the history of the compiling of Freud's works shows that he suppressed some things that um, he thought were just a bit too experimental in his early, uh, early years. But as his life progressed, as his fame grew, as his confidence developed, then these uh, works came to be included in, uh, in, later, in later collections. Okay, so uh, leaving uh, psyche behind, uh, let's say something about the term catharsis. And the famous work written by Freud and his collaborator, uh, Josef Breuer, is called Studies on Hysteria, came out in 1893, between 1893 and 1895. Its publication was preceded, however, by uh, what was called a preliminary communication. And in this uh, work, preliminary communication, uh, Freud and Breuer made uh, an interesting statement. They wrote, the injured person's reaction to the trauma only exercises a completely cathartic effect if it is an adequate reaction. And in contemporary psychotherapy, that's still called affect uh, as a technical term. Uh, meaning that uh, the client must really experience the power of the feelings for the treatment of trauma to have any uh, effect. But the idea of uh, Freud and Breuer, of course, echoes the famous passage of Aristotle in Aristotle's Poetics, where Aristotle talks about the effect of tragedy on the soul, on the psyche of the spectator. Um, and Aristotle writes, through pity and fear affecting the proper purgation of these emotions. Okay, purgation, catharsis again, the same word uh, being used across all these centuries, uh, passing from uh, Greek philosophy, a Greek philosophical tradition, uh, to these working clinicians. Now what's interesting is that Freud's wife, uh, Martha, was the niece of this man, Theodore Gompertz. And Gompertz was professor of classical philology at the University of Vienna. In 1897, this man actually published an edition of Aristotle's Poetics, the work from which um, that passage on catharsis comes. And the work um, published by Gompertz included an essay by the playwright Alfred von Berger. Um, and in Alfred von Berger's uh, essay, uh, the following passage appears on page 81. So von Berger writes, I quote, 
The cathartic treatment of hysteria, which the physicians Dr. Josef Breuer and Dr. Sigmund Freud have described, is very appropriate for making the cathartic theory of tragedy understandable. So there we've got the, um, the academic philological discourse uh, paying its respects to the, clinic, the clinical uh, work of Freud and uh, Freud and Breuer, showing that the exchange is working in both, uh, in both directions. And it's likely not only that uh, Freud and Gompertz um, uh, talked with each other about Aristotle and catharsis, they exchanged a number of, uh, of letters with each other, but in fact Gompertz's wife and daughter both ended up as uh, patients of Freud um, so, uh, so a, a very close connection between Freud and uh, and this uh, very eminent uh, philologist. Subsequently, in uh, 1905, Freud published an essay called "The Psychopathic Characters on the Stage," and the essay actually opened with uh, the passage of Aristotle. So, in the earlier work, he'd alluded to it. In the later work, he picked it up word for word and put it into uh, into his text. Okay, but above all, Freud is known for the interpretation of dreams. Um, this really is uh, the most famous of Freud's works for the uh, advocacy of his, um, uh, of his ideas um, on uh, instincts, human instincts, okay? Came out in 1900. So in this essay of 1900, uh, Freud again drew attention to Aristotle, but this time for a rather different reason. Uh, this time he identified Aristotle as being the first person who isolated the dream as a subject for psychological study. And he quotes Aristotle's essay on dreams, where Aristotle says, and I quote, the dream is a sort of mental image, a phantasma, and more particularly, it's one which occurs in sleep. Um, so Freud felt strongly the, the resonance of this, uh, of this passage in uh, Aristotle. And it led him to elaborate on the role of dreams in his most famous theory, the Oedipus complex. Okay, now, for the record, the Oedipus complex is uh, a theory that sees um, a phase of human development in which a male child develops an erotic attachment to his mother and corresponding patricidal feelings towards his father. Everybody knows uh, the Oedipus uh, complex. Okay, it is a central complex, um, a central idea to the whole thought uh, of, uh, of Freud. In another famous book, uh, Totem and Taboo, published in 1913 and 1914, he declared, and I quote, the beginnings of religion, morality, social life and art meet in the Oedipus complex. It is the fundamental uh, foundation of, uh, of everything. Now, as we've seen, uh, Freud had known about the, uh, the play uh, from his youth. And in the course of a period of what Freud technically called his autoanalysis, so that's his analysis of himself, as far as I can tell, uh, Freud never submitted himself to anybody else's analysis. He did it for himself, and I suppose why shouldn't he? Um, so uh, when he reflected and, and uh, studied himself, uh, he decided that this complex, in fact, had had uh, an impact uh, on his own life. And there he is talking about it uh, in the interpretation of dreams. I'll just read this out. I have found love of the mother and jealousy of the father in my own case too, and I believe it to be a general phenomenon of early childhood. Now, if that's the case, the gripping power of Oedipus Rex, that's the uh, Oedipus Tyrannus, in spite of all the rational objections to the inexorable fate that the story presupposes, becomes intelligible. Every member of the audience was once a budding Oedipus in fantasy, and this dream fulfillment played out in reality causes everyone to recoil in horror with the full measure of repression which separates his infantile from his present state. Okay. In other words, because uh, Freud, and he, Freud had seen the play uh, himself, he'd studied it, he'd seen it, because he uh, found um, and observed audiences to be so affected by it, he thought this was an historic phenomenon occurring uh, from generation to generation and extrapolated from that 
to, uh, to promote the idea that this is actually inherent uh, in the human male uh, condition. Now, if we return to Freud's library, also in it was a work by this man, uh, Johann Jakob Christian Donner, 1799 to 1875. Um, in particular, Freud owned a, a copy of uh, Donner's German translation of Sophocles' play, Oedipus Tyrannus. And the thing about Donner was that he was uh, famous for preserving the meter of uh, the original uh, Greek. So this is high art again in the uh, Romantic period. Uh, and uh, uh, so it, it, it's a, um, an exquisite, sophisticated um, skill as a, as a translator. But of course, it can lead to a certain flexibility, as it were, in the, uh, in the translation. Now, in Freud's copy of Donner's book, he actually underlined a single passage, only a single passage. Uh, and the passage he, he uh, underlined was Donner's translation of lines 981 to 983 of Sophocles' original. And it's a portion of Jocasta's speech to Oedipus in which she declares that many men in their dreams have slept with their mothers. So let me just show you the translation. I'll present the translation. Okay, so uh, and I'm suggesting here, is this a, an important translation for us uh, as we understand uh, Freud's uh, ideas? There's a literal translation of the Greek of Sophocles. For many mortals already also in dreams have slept with their mother, but to whom these things are nothing, he bears life most easily. But when you translate Donner into English translation again, literally, it reads, for many men have already seen also in dreams themselves mated with mother, but who holds all this as nothing bears the burden of life lightly. In other words, the translation provided by Donner adds a dimension where men observe themselves dreaming. Um, and it's this idea, remember the, the, the book in which this uh, occurs, it's this idea of the role of the dream that attracted uh, Freud uh, very closely to the text. And it looks like he's gone in through um, Donner's translation. He's been particularly affected uh, by this. He picked it out as one of these um, familiarities or parallels with his, own, uh, with his own thought. And it led Freud to encapsulate the play in this very uh, succinct and elegant way, again in the interpretation of dreams. The action of the play consists in nothing other than the process of revealing, with cunning delays and ever mounting excitement, a process that could be likened to the work of psychoanalysis. That Oedipus himself is the murderer of Laius, but further that he's the son of the murdered man on Jocasta. Appalled at the abomination which is unwittingly performed, Oedipus blinds himself and forsakes his home, the oracle is fulfilled. Okay, And the two terms I draw your attention to in that passage are the terms uh, revealing and process. Okay, So when we think about the Oedipus complex, when we think about the use that Freud makes of uh, these uh, persons, these personalities, the characters in the play, um, it's not just that they're mapped onto Freud's thought, he's attracted to the process. It's the drama of the play that he sees as being uh, the closest parallel um, with the, um, uh, with the uh, clinical work that he's doing, with the clinical theory, because the, um, the um, process of recovering from uh, mental illness uh, is just that. It's a revealing of the truth. And it's to be remembered as well that there is a heroic dimension to uh, Oedipus, because in the play when Oedipus is confronted with the possibility that the truth might be something terrible. Um, uh, the, the messenger who, uh, who begins to feed the information um, uh, kind of holds himself back and says he can't bring himself to speak the truth. Uh, and uh, Oedipus says, I must hear, I must hear the truth. So um, there is a, a, a kind of a heroic, a courageous quality in, in confronting uh, what's really true. Um, for all that the Oedipus cannot escape his fate, he is still prepared to listen to what the truth actually is. Now, 
As you can imagine, uh, this is a very controversial uh, theory. There were uh, gales of uh, uh, criticism against it. And in uh, 1924, uh, Freud wrote in uh, a work called The Resistances to Psychoanalysis uh, with an appeal to uh, Plato, no less a figure than Plato. And he said, what psychoanalysis called sexuality was by no means identical with the impulsion toward the union of the two sexes. It had far more resemblance to the all-inclusive and all-preserving eros of Plato's symposium. So um, when Freud uh, sought to defend himself, he, uh, he did so by appealing to uh, the authority and the philosophical ideas of uh, no less a figure than, uh, than Plato. And in the 1932 uh, new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, he went further uh, in citing Plato and he compared the uh, relationship between the ego and the id uh, to that of a rider uh, to his horse. Uh, and that's a simile that recalled very closely uh, Plato's Phaedrus, where the tripartite soul is described as a chariot and two horses, one of them fine and well disciplined and the other ugly and, uh, and disobedient. Now, in the later years uh, of Freud and Freudian thought, he uh, developed his ideas on human instincts further. And he published in 1937 quite a late work uh, called Analysis Terminable and Interminable. Um, and in this work, he uh, developed a new uh, dimension to his theory of instincts. Um, and he isolated the death instinct, thanatos, uh, Greek word for death, um, and he contrasted it with eros, uh, and he held the two to be in, uh, in tension, uh, in historic tension. And he says explicitly that he came across what he thought um, were precursor ideas in the work of Empedocles, the uh, 5th century BC uh, philosopher. And um, Empedocles had um, suggested the existence of two great natural energies, which he called philia, love, and nekos, dis discordance. Um, and Freud actually acknowledged that he had read the work um, of Wilhelm Capell, um, who published uh, a book called The Pre-Socratics in, uh, in 1935. And uh, later on, so Freud's quite an old man now, and uh, this, this connection, um, this idea that uh, Empedocles had prefigured his own thought in some way prompted this interesting uh, reflection from him. And he says, I'm very ready to give up the prestige of originality for the sake of such a confirmation, especially as I can never be certain in view of the wide extent of my reading in early years, whether what I took for a new creation might not be an effect of cryptoamnesia. Um, again, a really, really Freudian idea of that. Um, that you can believe something to be your own idea when in fact uh, it, is, it is something that you've already encountered but buried away in your, uh, in your uh, unconscious, in your subconscious. Um, and having looked at uh, Thanatos and Eros, he came to uh, a very sweeping judgment on uh, history itself. Uh, so here's another famous uh, statement from, uh, from Freud, this time from uh, civilization and its discontent. And he wrote, and now it seems to me the meaning of the evolution of culture is no longer a riddle to us. It must present to us the struggle between eros and death, between the instincts of life and the instincts of destruction, as it works itself out in the human species. And uh, this idea again shows um, how at really, really fundamental levels in uh, Freud's thought, um, an appeal is made directly to uh, Greek thought um, and uh, Greek concepts. And that brings us to the world of archaeology. Freud's own doctor, a man called Max Schur, um, said of Freud that his addiction to collecting antiquities was second only to his addiction uh, to nicotine. And Freud began collecting uh, antiquities. This is his study in, in Vienna, and you can see it's crowded with all kinds of objects. He began collecting these objects in the 1890s in the context of his father's death, 
which was um, a time of great tribulation for him. His father died in October 1886 and um, accompanying the uh, grief that he felt also came a great wave of uh, depression about the failure of his, his ideas to establish him in, uh, in mainstream um, uh, medical uh, research. Um, so it, this means that he also um, took to writing the interpretation of dreams in, in the same period. So the 1890s are very important, um, uh, very important period in Freud's life. Um, so he began collecting antiquities then in the uh, 1890s. Um, he apparently, um, for a number of years, visited uh, Viennese antique dealers twice a week. Um, he researched the objects himself, himself, and he was a great visitor to um, the great museums of Europe as he travelled around giving his, uh, giving his lectures. He came actually to own more than 2,000 objects of all kinds, busts and papyri and... Um, uh, what you might call titulae or, or inscriptions, small inscriptions. And um, many ancient civilizations were uh, represented in his collection, but particularly prominent were Egyptian and Greco-Roman objects. Um, and uh, among his beloved possessions uh, were images of Isis and Artemis and Athena. And here's one of Freud's most famous patients. This is uh, the wolf man. Uh, when Freud came to write up the case histories, um, he concealed the identity of the patients and uh, he gave them uh, nicknames and this is the wolfman so-called because he had a, a disturbing uh, recurring dream of uh, wolves in a, in a walnut tree. He was actually uh, a Russian aristocrat called Sergei Pankyayev um, and um, uh, the wolfman reported the experience of being treated by Freud in his, um, in his uh, rooms in Vienna. But he, he commented on the, uh, the layout of the room and he commented on the objects in it and he said that in the room there was, and I quote him here, a feeling of peace and quiet. Everything here contributed to one's feeling of leaving the haste of modern life behind, of being sheltered from one's daily cares. So uh, Freud, along with other uh, therapists, both, uh, both uh, um, you know, contemporary and uh, historical, paid, paid a lot of attention to the um, the atmosphere of the room in which the work took place. Um, and as we've seen, uh, that atmosphere was created in a significant part by these ancient objects. Now, in actual fact, he took these objects, many of them, uh, around as he traveled uh, to work or to lecture. He packed them up uh, and took them around Europe with him. And he called them his old and grubby gods. And you can see them there literally, um, uh, literally uh, uh, at the workspace, at his working space, they're right uh, uh, right uh, next door to him as he's, as he's going about his work. And he wrote in 1899, as he was finishing um, the interpretation of dreams, uh, I quote, my old and grubby gods take part in the work as paperweights for my manuscripts. So they were kind of his companions as he, uh, as he went about his work. Now, uh, Freud, uh, while Freud was doing all his work, there was another uh, front, another research uh, um, um, adventure taking place. And that was really the development of modern archaeology. And Freud was a huge admirer of uh, this man, Heinrich uh, Schliemann, seen here uh, with his wife, Sophia Schliemann. Uh, she's pictured in a notorious uh, photograph where some of the, uh, the treasures uh, discovered by uh, Schliemann um, were actually used to adorn his own wife, um, to show them again in, in, uh, in situ, as it were. Um, so um, Freud was a great admirer of Schliemann. He actually owned three of Schliemann's books, we can see from his library. He owned My Canine, published in 1878. He owned Ilios, published in 1881, and Tyrans, published in 1886. And what's interesting about Schliemann is that in his own time, he was actually very uh, controversial uh, with, uh, with scholars um, and uh, other you know, researchers. Uh, above all because of his method um, and uh, this is uh, an age when as it were scientific archaeological archaeology is trying to uh, assert itself in a world where um, antiquarianism and amateurism uh, is still very is still very prominent there's a great uh, a great joke made at uh, Schliemann's expense 
uh, by one of his collaborators, a man called uh, Max Moor. And Moore uh, said of uh, Schliemann that he was uh, the man who discovered Troy and destroyed it for the last time. Um, but what's interesting about one aspect of the method of Schliemann is that he was notorious with some of the scientific archaeologists as being a preserver of everything, everything. Uh, the word that Schliemann used was debris. And that's a very interesting word to use in the context of uh, psychoanalytic uh, research as well. Um, so uh, in the middle of Freud's admiration of Schliemann um, is this, um, is this uh, noting of uh, the techniques of uh, Schliemann as well. The other thing about Schliemann was that he was a great, um, he was a great identifier of some of this debris as having uh, or as being erotically charged. And I tried to get some illustrations of this, but, but um, I could only find them in, in, in poor quality uh, prints. But they're, they're very funny. Uh, objects that are really um, uh, kind of nondescript are described in quite some detail as, as, as having um, you know, genitalia and having erotic charge. Um, so Schliemann really was, um, um, was um, you know, very much uh, you know, an, an interpreter of these of these uh, objects in a way that uh, maybe you know might have struck a chord with uh, with Freud. And here's a famous statement made uh, by uh, uh, Freud to his uh, companion uh, William Fleece uh, about a breakthrough that he had with another one of his patients. And he writes to Fleece, "I can hardly bring myself to believe it. It's as if Schliemann had dug up another Troy, which had hitherto been believed uh, to be mythical." So uh, there we have the. Uh, we have the psychoanalyst as a kind of archaeologist digging down into the layers of, uh, of the personality. And later on in his life, uh, in a rare essay on uh, female sexuality, uh, Freud began to modify his uh, Oedipus complex, began to adapt it uh, to uh, the female psyche. Um, and he posited what he called a pre-Oedipal phase, uh, pre uh, phase in women. And he wrote, I quote, our insight into this early pre-Oedipus uh, comes to us as, as a surprise, like a discovery in another field of the Minoan Mycenaean civilization behind the civilization of Greece. So uh, there we are, the uh, psychoanalyst as uh, an excavator. And of course, the parallel to which Freud appeals is uh, the parallel of Schliemann and the recovery of pre-Hellenistic uh, culture. Okay, all of which takes us to where we began. Okay, so here's this uh, crater again. Of this object, Freud wrote, um, it's a pity one cannot take it into one's grave. So it was much, uh, much loved by him. He was very moved by it. And uh, as you can see, he chose it to be his uh, final uh, resting place. And what's interesting is the, uh, the decoration of the crater itself is uh, explicitly Dionysian, okay? Uh, it features the vegetal staff, the thyrsus, the wine cup, uh, the vine leaf, a uh, bunch of grapes. Um, but it's to be remembered that Dionysi Dionysus is not just the god of wine. Uh, Dionysus is also famously the god of theatre and of madness and of transportation to uh, altered states of ecstatic consciousness. Um, and on the crater, there are various figures, but these include two cloaked figures, clearly uh, dressed and ready for uh, a journey. Um, on both sides of the crater um, are these uh, um, oblong objects, um, and they're frequently labelled uh, termon in, uh, in objects of this kind, and they're, they, they're way markers, um, and they mark the beginning and end of uh, journeys. So. Um, this uh, idea of life as a journey into different realms of consciousness, I think, is what struck is what struck Freud. And what's interesting is that uh, late on uh, in his life, when Freud mused uh, about his own career, looked back on his own achievements, he imagined that if he was starting out again, he might actually be uh, a student of mythology and the occult. Um, so it was very interesting. Uh, point uh, to reach uh, for, the, uh, for the, mature, uh, the mature Freud. So where does all that leave us then? Uh, let's try and sum this up. Well, I want to put a number of suggestions to you. 
Um, the first is to suggest that in looking at Freud's scientific method, it's clear that uh, the method was informed by a very strong historical sense. Um, and what I mean by that is that Freud thought that he could see uh, patterns of thought and human behaviour appearing over the course of time and his uh, appreciation of history and of the literature and reflections produced by ancient cultures uh, was a very important point, a very important um, uh, concept um, that informed his ideas, that proved to him that um, the things he was talking about were inherent in the uh, human organism. Uh, the second thing I want to suggest to you is that it's impossible to understand the genesis of uh, Freud's ideas without locating them in the much broader world of uh, discourse, cultural and academic discourse on uh, Greek and Roman culture uh, of the time. Um, he owed a, a, a great debt, I think, to Nietzsche. Um, uh, Freud himself always denied ever reading Nietzsche. Um, Nietzsche famously had gone mad and to be associated with with Nietzsche uh, ran the risk, I think, of, um, of uh, undermining Freud's uh, sense of standing. Um, but it, it, it's, it's pretty clear um, in his private correspondence that he was acquainted with some of Nietzsche's ideas. And I think you can trace a line from uh, Freud through Burkhardt to Nietzsche uh, uh, as well. Very important figures um, and uh, very distinguished uh, classical scholars. Um, when it comes to religion, Freud was famously, um, he called himself a godless Jew, and he denounced what he called the lie of salvation uh, in Christianity. But um, as he matured, he became increasingly interested in, um, in religion as a phenomenon. And in uh, uh, his work, the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, he wrote, the, th the theory of instincts is, as it were, our mythology. The instincts are mythical beings superb in their indefiniteness. And in another letter he wrote to Wilhelm Fleiss, he said to himself, I am by nature nothing but a conquistador, an adventurer with all the inquisitiveness, daring and tenacity of such a man. And when you think about it, inquisitiveness, daring and tenacity really in some ways are the classical hero. Uh, so in some ways I think Freud himself was a kind of Odyssean figure he was um, an heroic adventurer in, in a strange and sometimes dangerous world. He was a man like Odysseus, uh, like Aeneas as well, a man who struggled for recognition, struggled for legitimacy, uh, legitimacy as well. And I want to finish now with uh, this final point about Freud's life. When you study Freud, um, one of the striking things about him is that towards the end of his life, from well more than a more than a decade, he suffered terribly from uh, from cancer, serious cancer, uh, disfiguring, painful uh, disease. And um, one of many things that's impressive about him is that he faced this disease with great fortitude and equanimity. And I suggest to you here that here is one last and poignant connection uh, between Freud and the classical figure most closely associated with him, because. When you look at Sophocles' other play um, about Oedipus, Oedipus at Colonus, um, a play very late in uh, Sophocles' life, written when he was about 90 years old, uh, in about 406, um, the play deals with the, uh, the end of Oedipus' life, and the play uh, comes to a climax with, um, uh, after a lifetime of uh, suffering, uh, Oedipus is portrayed as um, enjoying a kind of blessed relief. Um, the blind king is taken gently from life after terrible sufferings. Um, he's taken from life uh, in a peaceful sacred grove and here is, uh, here is that passage as reported in Oedipus at Colonus. For no fiery thunderbolt of the god made away with him, nor any whirlwind rising out to sea at that time, but either some escort come from the gods or the unlighted foundation of the earth that belongs to those below, opening in kindness. For the man was taken away with no lamentations and by no painful disease, but if any, among mortals, by a miracle. So among the last objects that Freud's eyes ever saw, um, as he passed away quietly in his, uh, in his own study, um, were the timeless gods of the ancients. 
presiding over a world of mystery, voyaging and discovery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, John. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Absolutely brilliant. Um, now, you're going to take some questions, is that right? You happy enough? I, I will do, do my best, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there are a couple of, oh, there are three questions in the chat. Um, first of all, Victoria says, uh, she has a question regarding the concept of process and how Freud was intrigued by the tragedy of Oedipus. Um, she says, could you talk more about uh, the change exhibited in Oedipus character from the beginning to the end of the play and if Freud referred to this? Um, well, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, I couldn't claim to be a specialist and um, some of our Hellenists might want to come in um, um, my, my answer to that is that Freud didn't, he didn't carry out a literary analysis. Um, he focused in on, um, on uh, Oedipus as a man uh, living in, in, a, in, a fated, in a fated role. The idea of something that was, um, the idea that, that, that he was the, um, the, the kind of victim, the victim of uh, circumstances that were beyond his control, um, that he had inherent difficulties in his life, um, but above all, above all, it, it's the revelation. And you can see, I think, clinically. Um, I mean, as a as a therapist, you can see how he was energized by the um, those kind of breakthroughs in um, in the work with his patients, and that I think explains his attraction to that climactic scene. Um, and that um, uh, that uh, unveiling of the truth about Oedipus. Um, so he's not he's not um, uh, an explorer of the play from beginning to end. And you can see, you, although that said, you can see. Um, I, I think that's a really good his his summary of of, uh, of the play is actually really really intelligent and really a really um, concise um, um, sort of summary of what happens. Is that is that okay, Victoria? Okay. Thanks, John. Okay, the next question is from Maria. She says, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, you've described the invention of the modern personality, but I'm wondering if Freud in any way anticipated studies on the ancient sense of self. How exactly is he reading Aristotle? Is it surface level reading or is he doing actual philology? Yeah, it's not it's not philology, um, and um, I, I would I would emphasise to you um, that uh, Freud is really kind of reaching out to antiquity and bringing it forward into uh, into his own his own uh, his own time. He's he's not he's not um, uh, he's not looking back at that world on its own terms. But of course, his great gift, his great debt. Um, uh, you know, with psychoanalysis, which has not caught on. Psychoanalysis is not mainstream in, in clinical work with mental health, but it is alive and well in literary criticism. Um, so what he's given to the study of literature is the capacity, the willingness, the enthusiasm for reaching back from modernity into the world uh, of the Greeks and discovering for ourselves uh, their personalities, um, uh, you know, using uh, the Freudian method. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Maria. Um, next from Robert. Uh, at the beginning and then close to the end, you said a word on Nietzsche. Would you say any more about his influence on Freud, if there is any? Well, as I said, Freud was very wary of, he was very wary of uh, acknowledging Nietzsche. And there is, as far as I can tell, no evidence um, of Freud citing Nietzsche formally, um, but uh, there, there was a kind of minor academic industry in, uh, in, in burrowing away into Freud's writing to discover Nietzschean ideas. 
Um, so that that's that remains, I think, a mystery about about Freud's work. Um, I mean, I, I I'm happy to stand over the idea that that well, that, that the line can be drawn, um, but I'm I'm only doing so in broad uh, in, in broad terms. All I would say about about Nietzsche is that he is uh, absolutely terrific, absolutely terrific on this subject. He wrote a great book called. Um, uh, called We Philologists, and the, 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 the great thing about Nietzsche's books is that his eyesight was so terrible he couldn't write extended texts, so he tended to encapsulate his, his thinking in these really short, kind of pithy, polemical statements, and the essay We Philologists should be required reading for every, everybody above the level of, uh, of lecturer teaching classics and classical studies, because if you ever thought you were something special, uh, Nietzsche will bring you down. Um, and what Nietzsche was doing was he was uh, liberating the passions of antiquity, the passions of the Greeks from this, um, what's certainly to my mind, this kind of hideous straitjacket of, of strict and scientific philology. Um, there were tremendous battles between, uh, between uh, you know, Burkhardt and this new kind of thinking. And one notorious character in particular called Vilimovitz, um, who, who's a, a terrific scholar of the time, um, I wanted to, to put a slide of him up, but he's so forbidding looking that he's just too terrifying to look at. Um, but um, but it, it, it's, a, it's a dynamic and very controversial period for the, uh, the history of the scholarship. Um, but um, I hope you got a sense of, of how brilliant uh, Burkhardt's ideas are and uh, what a brilliant thinker he was, how insightful. Thank you, John. Right, that's that's the end of the. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions? I've read all the questions from the chat. Anything else you would like to ask, John? Um, well, I'm going to ask. Oh, here's one. I'm not going to take from other people's. Right, Una. Una says, uh, in terms of sexual development, Oedipus theory, etc., did Freud mention anything about homosexuality? And if yeah, so... Freud, Freud thought that homosexuality was, um, was, um, an, how can I put this? It was, it was a deviant, it was a deviant um, state of health, as it were, but he had no prejudice um, and he thought it, it arose from developmental, developmental, um, circumstances um, as it were emotional uh, environment um, so he in fact I thought for his time was very even-handed in that sense wasn't judgmental um, but didn't make didn't make a comprehensive study of it okay um, thank you any other questions from anyone else shout out to us Okay, I just want to ask something about, um, you talked about the, the Oedipus complex and that um, boys dream about having, um, sleeping with their, their mother and killing their father, um, or sleeping with their mother at least. But so Oedipus would have thought of this. Now the Oracle said that Oedipus was going to marry his mother and kill his father, but was it, there's an inevitability what Freud says that it was inevitable that this was going to happen so is he stepping into the oracle if you like I suppose he takes he takes the oracle uh, the oracle and I mean when you think about what an oracle is uh, the oracle has a, has, a, has a mystical a supernatural understanding of what reality is um, but it is an understanding that is not accessible to mortals um, and in a way, the, the, the undiscovered, uh, the undiscovered truth um, is still is still a truth. Um, uh, so, um, so in that in that sense, um, it's it's that's the analogy with with what is determined, as it were, by nature by natural development. Um, so, nature itself is the oracle in that sense. Okay. But you must you must communicate. You must communicate clearly with nature. You must find a way of communicating with nature in order to discern the truth. Which is amazing because the thing about, about, about Freud is, I mean, Freud began his, um, he began his research career um, dissecting eels and examining their testicles. 
Um, so he, he, that, that, that's where he began, but he ended up in, in such a different place um, from very hard science through to something, I mean, you, you heard me, you know, you heard Freud talking about how indescribably beautiful the mysteries were of, uh, of, of, the, of the instincts. Um, so um, he, he was temperamentally a hard scientist, but a guy who actually came around to dealing with this fantastic, mysterious, imponderable world. It's an amazing story. Mm. Thank you. No. Any other questions from anyone? Any comments? Can Maybe. I say? Can I say something, Helen? John, thank you so much for that talk. It was really interesting, and that kind of sense of mystery got to me, especially when I saw the desk with all the little dollies of the, you know, mm. <laughs> Isis and and um, Athena and everybody there, and you know. I mean, how far do you think that he thought, you know, that, that, was he religious in, no, in any, no. no? Well, he didn't, he didn't say so. He didn't say so, but the, the idea of godless, I'm a godless Jew, he said. Yes. You know, and, and he ended up writing, you wrote, you wrote a book on Moses and monotheism. Um, and he was also very struck by Michelangelo's Moses, wrote an essay about that. So um, he, he, he did have a kind of, he, he had a kind of a, a, a mystical dimension to himself that he wouldn't, that he never really fully acknowledged, you know. And that he uh, found in the classics and in the objects, even that he, you know, that he put on his yeah. desk, he, you could sort of have the feeling that he was, you know, as he was working and thinking about things, these were looking yeah. at him and he was kind of feeling the energy of them or something. It's, so, it's kind of so, you explained it so, so well, I'm not, I'm not doing you justice, but that's what I, I got from it. It was really, it's really interesting. Yeah. I, th I think that's right, and, and uh, you know the idea of him, the idea of him travelling to some congress or to some lecture, and, and, and either taking out or put having somebody take case. out his suitcase and put them in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apparently, he used to he used to buy when he bought the objects, he would bring them to the family table and put them at the table, set them at the <laughs> table, you know, with his children around, and uh, and, and ask people what they thought of them. Thanks, John. Thank, thank you, Maeve. Helen, would you like to? No, yeah, that was really great. I really enjoyed that. And I was, I was really interested by the way he seemed to, your reading suggested that he was sort of shaped by his experiences of anti-Semitism. And I'm wondering what, what Freud might have thought about the disciplinary shape of classics today. Would, would he have seen the Greek and Roman cultures as um, particularly important or separate, or would you have tended to see them as part of a wider ancient? Right. I I think. Well, well, well. Interesting. Again, here again, there's a complicated answer to that question. Um, Freud was a fantastic um, um, enemy of modernism. He he uh, he hated uh, modern art. Um, he, he thought it was. He thought they were all bluffers. Uh, couldn't get his head around that. So. You know, in, in artistic terms, he couldn't understand modern modern music either. Although, in fact, he, in fact, he was sketched by Salvador Dali, um, and he talked about about watching Salvador Dali's eyes uh, darting about, full of light. He was intrigued by Dali, so he he he, 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 he let himself be uh, be sketched. He he hated modern art, modern music. But that said, I think he would have loved the 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 the, the spirit of uh, exploration in modern in modern scholarship. I think he would have loved the inventiveness of, of uh, you know, literary criticism, um, and he would have appreciated the the sense of mystery. I think that that many of us feel, you know, in our encounter, uh, in our encounter with um, with the, the classics. And I just actually have um, just a, a little statement from him now. Hold on. There was one last statement I wanted to show you. Can I? Can I? Let's see. Can I share with you briefly one last slide? I forgot to show this one. Would that be okay, Helen? Yes, of course, yes. I, I just I just want to show you this slide. Oh, oh share screen, here we go. I forgot to put this up. I, I really like this. Um, can I go? Can you give me control of this, Helen, or? Oh, I can't show. Oh, yes, there, here it comes. Okay, here he is. Um, and in, in 1912, he was asked to contribute to his school magazine. 
Um, and he wrote that he was indebted to the school because the school had given him, as he says here, my glimpse of an extinct civilization, which in my case was to bring me as much consolation as anything else in the struggles of life. And it seemed to me, when I read that, I thought, I think that's the reason why many of us actually study what we study, because there's something very, um, there's something consoling about the encounter with uh, this very diverse um, and sophisticated uh, world. And it's full of messages and full of consolations that are communicated, I think, to us in, uh, in modernity. So I don't know whether that's an answer or not. That's, I, I think it, it, he, would have liked, he would have liked much of what we do. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Have we... Whoops. I have the wrong button. Uh, have we any other... Is there anything else in the chat? No. Okay. Any other questions or comments for John? Okay. Right. John, I think that's us. And um, thank you, first of all, to John for preparing that fascinating presentation. Um, yep. Applause. <laughs> um, thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. Great to see you. Um, there was an issue, I believe, with the link, and I apologise profusely for that. Um, but glad to see everyone here, and I did try to reply to those that, that messaged me. Um, our next event, as I said, is the 19th of May. Um, I'll be in touch about that. Um, and I've also, uh, I have some, I, I see Joan and Andrew there. Hi, Joan and Andrew in Dublin. Um, I have a list of Classical Association of Ireland events to send out, so I'll be doing that as well. Um, so this is the, the beauty of us being online. Um, we can all come together. It's, it's fantastic. And um, so thank you all for joining us and hope to see you uh, at the next one. Great. Thanks Thank you very much. much.